The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Chapter 3, Busy at War and Love. Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly, who was sitting by an open window in a pleasant rearward apartment, which was bedroom, breakfast room, dining room, and library combined. The balmy summer air, the restful quiet, the odor of the flowers, and the drowsing murmur of the bees had had their effect, and she was nodding over her knitting, for she had no company but the cat, and it was asleep in her lap. Her spectacles were propped up on her gray head for safety. She had thought of that, of course, Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered at seeing him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. He said, Mayn't I go and play now, aunt? What already? How much have you done? It's all done, aunt. Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it. I ain't, aunt. It is all done. Aunt Polly placed small trust in such evidence. She went out to see for herself, and she would have been content to find 20% of Tom's statement true. When she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground, her astonishment was almost unspeakable. She said, well, I never, there's no getting around it. You can work when you've a mind to, Tom. And then she diluted the compliment by adding, but it's a powerful seldom you're a mind to, I'm bound to say. Well, Go along and play, but mind you get back sometime in a week, or I'll tan you. She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she took him into the closet and selected a choice apple and delivered it to him, along with an improving lecture upon the added value and flavor a treat took to itself when it came without sin through virtuous effort. And while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a donut. Then he skipped out saw Sid starting up the outside stairway that led to the back rooms on the second floor. Clods were handy, and the air was full of them in a twinkling. They raged around Sid like a hailstorm, and before Aunt Polly could collect her surprised faculties and Sally to the rescue, six or seven clods had taken personal effect, and Tom was over the fence and gone. There was a gate, but as a general thing, he was too crowded for time to make use of it. His soul was at peace now that he had settled with Sid for calling attention to his black thread and getting him into trouble. Tom skirted the block and came round into a muddy alley that led by the back of his aunt's cow stable. He presently got safely beyond the reach of capture and punishment and hastened toward the public square of the village, where two military companies' boys had met for conflict according to previous appointment. Tom was general of one of these armies, Joe Harper a bosom friend, general of the other. These two great commanders did not condescend to fight in person, that being better suited to the still smaller fry, but sat together on an eminence and conducted the field operations by orders delivered through aides de camp. Tom's army won a great victory after a long and hard-fought battle. Then the dead were counted, prisoners exchanged, the terms of the next disagreement agreed upon, and the day for the necessary battle appointed, after which the armies fell into line and marched away, and Tom turned homeward alone. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden, a lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails, white summer frock, and embroidered pantalettes. The fresh-crowned hero fell without firing a shot. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished out of his heart and left not even a memory of herself behind. He had thought he had loved her to distraction. He had regarded his passion as adoration, and behold, it was only a poor little evanescent partiality. He had been gone, been months winning her, she had confessed hardly a week ago. He had been the happiest and the proudest boy in the world, only seven short days, and here, in one instant of time, she had gone out of his heart like a casual stranger whose visit is done. He worshipped this new angel with furtive eye till he saw that she had discovered him. Then he pretended he did not know she was present and began to show off in all sorts of absurd boyish ways in order to win her admiration. He kept up this grotesque foolishness for some time, but by and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside and saw that the little girl was wending her way toward the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it, grieving and hoping she would tarry yet a while longer. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold, but his face lit up right away, for she tossed a pansy over the fence a moment before she disappeared. The boy ran round and stopped within a foot or two of the flower and then shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look down the street as if he had discovered something of interest going on in that direction. Presently, he picked up a straw and began trying to balance it on his nose, and with his head tilted far back, and as he moved from side to side in his efforts, he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally, his bare foot rested upon it, his pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with the treasure and disappeared round the corner. 
but only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket next to his heart, or next to his stomach, possibly, for he was not much posted in anatomy, and not hypocritical anyway. He returned now, and hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before, but the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that she had been near some window meantime, and had been aware of his attentions. Finally, he rode home reluctantly, with his poor head full of visions. All through supper, his spirits were so high that his aunt wondered what had got into the child. He took a good scolding about clodding Sid, and did not seem to mind it in the least. He tried to steal sugar under his very aunt's nose, and got his knuckles wrapped for it. He said, Aunt, you don't whack Sid when he takes it. Well, Sid, don't torment a body the way you do. You'd be always into that sugar if I weren't watching you. Presently, she stepped into the kitchen, and Sid, happy with his immunity, reached for the sugar bowl, a sort of glorying over Tom, which was well-nigh unbearable. But Sid's fingers slipped, and the bowl dropped and broke. Tom was in ecstatics, in such ecstasies that he even controlled his tongue and was silent. He said to himself that he would not speak a word, even when his aunt came in, but would sit perfectly still till she asked who did the mischief, and then he would tell, and there would be nothing so good in the world to see that pet model catch it. He was so brimful of exultation that he could hardly hold himself when the old lady came back and stood above the wreck, discharging lightnings of wrath from over her spectacles. He said to himself, Now it's coming! And the next instant he was sprawling on the floor. The potent palm was uplifted to strike again when Tom cried out, Hold on now! What are you about me for? Sid broke it! Aunt Polly paused, perplexed, and Tom looked for healing pity. But when she got her tongue again, she only said, mm. Well, you didn't get a lick of miss, I reckon. You've been into some other audacious mischief when I wasn't around, like enough. Then her conscience reproached her, and she yearned to say something kind and loving, but she judged that this would be construed into a confession that she had been in the wrong, and the discipline forbade that. So she kept silence and went about her affairs with a troubled heart. Tom sulked in a corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, and he was morosely gratified by the consciousness of it. He would hang out no signals. He would take no notice of none. He knew that a yearning glance fell upon him now and then through a film of tears, but he refused recognition of it. He pictured himself lying sick unto death and his aunt bending over him, beseeching one little forgiven word, but he would turn his face to the wall and die with that word unsaid. Ah, uh, how would she feel then? And he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead with his curls all wet and his sore heart at rest. How would she throw herself upon him and how her tears would fall like rain and her lips pray to God to give her back her boy and she would never, never abuse him any more. But he would lie there cold and white and make no sign, a poor little sufferer whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing. It was so like to choke and his eyes swam in a blur of water which overflowed when he winked, and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sorrow that he could not bear to have any worldly cheeriness or any grating delight intrude upon it. It was too sacred for such contact, and so presently, when his cousin Mary danced in, all alive with the joy of seeing home again after an age-long visit of one week to the country, he got up and moved in clouds and darkness out at one door as she brought song and sunshine in at the other. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him, and he seated himself on its outer edge and contemplated the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned all at once and unconsciously without undergoing the comfortable routine devised by nature. Then he thought of his flower. He got it out, rumpled and wilted, and it mightily increased his dismal felicity. He wondered if she would pity him if she knew. Would she cry and wish that she had a right to put her arms around his neck and comfort him? Or would she turn coldly away like all the hollow world? This picture brought such an agony of pleasurable suffering that he worked it over and over again in his mind and set it up in new and varied lights till he wore it threadbare. At last he rose up, sighing, and departed in the darkness. About half past nine or ten o'clock he came along the deserted street to where the adored unknown lived. He paused a moment. No sound fell upon his listening ear. A candle was casting a dull glow upon the curtain of a second-story window. Was the sacred presence there? He climbed the fence, threaded his stealthy way through the plants till he stood under that window. He looked up at it long and with emotion. Then he laid himself down on the ground under it, disposing himself upon his back 
with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower, and thus he would die, out in the cold world with no shelter over his homeless head, no friendly hand to wipe the death damps over his brow, no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came, and thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning, and oh, would she drop one little tear upon his poor lifeless form, would, he, would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted, so untimely cut down. The window went up, a maid servant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm, and a deluge of water drenched the prone martyr's remains. The strangling hero sprang up with a relieving snort. There was a whiz of a missile in the air mingled with the murmur of a curse, a sound as of shivering glass followed, and a small vague form went over the fence and shot away into the gloom. Not long after, as Tom, all undressed for bed, was surveying his drenched garments by the light of a tallow dip, Sid woke. But if he had any dim idea of making any references to illusions, he thought better of it and held his peace, for there was danger in Tom's eye. Tom turned in without the added vexation of prayers, and Sid made mental note of the omission. <laughs>